This episode of Internet Today is brought to you by Omaha Steaks and Stamps.com. Former President Donald Trump was many things to many people. Was he a buffoon, a monster, a cult leader, or the second coming of Christ? Now, these perceptions differ drastically based on any two people you spoke to in this country. But there's one thing we really didn't consider Donald Trump could become while he was serving as 45th president of these United States. A walking, talking, biological weapon who might have attempted to take out one of his political rivals while still in office. But it looks like that may have been the case. It sounds crazy when you say it like that. <laughs> but it's actually what happened. Uh, yeah. If, if literally the people in his office are to be believed, uh, specifically his chief of staff at the time, and uh, corroborated by others that were working for him. Yeah, so to catch you up, we all remember back then in the glory days of, what was it, September 2020? Yeah. Around there, mm -hmm. when it was announced that Donald Trump had coronavirus. It was it was one of the wildest days in the history of the internet. And the a, world. A great night to be <laughs> online. Yes. Uh, we were in a voice chat with like 20 people, all just laughing. It was like, uh, it was, it was uh, like a New Year's Eve party. It was the funniest thing that could possibly happen. Yes. And uh, yeah, certainly one of the most traffic days for social media websites and news networks. It was a moment that at the time seemed almost inevitable. Yes, it did seem like, the like man, who could have seen this coming? The man had been tempting fate for quite a while. Mm -hmm. He had only recently started wearing masks. And, uh, and that was out of yeah. obligation by people who were like, sir, the debates are coming. Like, you're in re-election. That you have to you have to do something. They designed a special mask for him that had like a really strong jawline. Yeah, of course. He had a custom made mask mm -hmm. that did look good. And he's it was like, tailored. I look like Zorro or the Lone Ranger. <laughs> sure, whatever you say, sir. Just as long as you wear it. So yeah, leading up to that, Trump had publicly and very intentionally avoided taking even the most basic precautions for himself in regards to the virus. While of course, anyone coming into contact with him or his family were subject to constant testing. Mm -hmm. He mocked mask wearing and social distancing. He turned the country against scientists and doctors and even made a show of how preventative measures made you look weak. Like when he very oddly commented on Joe Biden's safety measures at a presidential debate during last year's election by saying that Biden, quote, shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. I've never seen a bigger mask. It, it covers his entire body. It's incredible. <laughs> he really went above and beyond. Like it's so, it's such a strange offhanded comment. The like, biggest mask I've ever seen. I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Now, while the size of Joe Biden's mask might not have added any additional protection, no matter how comically large Trump portrayed it to be, uh, it looks like Biden is very lucky that he took as many precautions as possible at that debate because according to numerous recent reports, Donald Trump had already tested positive for the coronavirus and was aware of it before that first debate against Joe Biden. Trump seems to have known that he had coronavirus. Then he attended a public event with an audience and a moderator and candidate Joe Biden, who is old as fuck, alongside their families and their staff, and then proceeded to not only mock preventative measures, but also fill the surrounding air with a highly contagious virus. And, and that's uh, in addition to the, the other stuff coming out of his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He filled the air with a highly contagious virus and also COVID-19. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, someone pointed out that, like, the only person is in his entire family that was wearing a mask was Malaya. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And he was apparently well aware that he was uh, committing something that would be considered a war crime live on primetime television. When you put it like that. Sure. But if, if we're going to call that a war crime, then we're going to have to start calling... What we did to all the Native Americans in this country a war crime. And that sounds like critical race theory. That does sound so, like critical race theory to me, Elliot. We won't have that in this classroom no. or any classroom in America. Nope. It's banned. But here's the Washington Post with more. President Donald Trump tested positive for the coronavirus days before he shared the debate stage with then-Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden in late September 2020, according to his former chief of staff and two others familiar with the former president's test. The timing means Trump would have had reason to believe he was infected with coronavirus three days before the September 29th presidential debate and six days before he was hospitalized for COVID-19 at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. The White House did not reveal the positive test publicly or inform debate organizers at the time. 
In The Chief's Chief, due to be published next week, Meadows writes that Trump received a negative result from a different test shortly after his positive one. In a statement Wednesday morning, Trump denied Meadows' account of events. The story of me having COVID before or during the first debate is fake news, <laughs> Trump said. In fact, a test revealed that I did not have COVID before the debate. And like we said before, it is way more improbable to have a false positive uh, than a false negative. Meaning, if you test positive, you almost certainly have it. Yeah. If you test negative, there is a much larger margin of error. There's human error that goes into collecting it. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And um, look, I'm not saying this happened, but it, he seems like the person who would want uh, a rapid amount of tests to be done until one was negative. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it also goes without saying that Trump was literally fucking hospitalized with COVID-19 just days after the debate. So it's not even like he never had it or something like that. And this was just made up to make yeah. it look bad. It's like, no. The timing checks out. Yeah. It he, makes sense. He went to the debate, which by the way, he showed up late to and didn't get tested by the debate staff, which was a thing that was supposed to happen. Well, when you're the president, they let you do it. Yeah. So he arrived late so that that couldn't happen. Uh, which is very strange. Uh, he also, at the time, everyone remarked during that debate, seemed very low energy. This isn't the Trump we're used to. And aside from that- Almost like his lung capacity might have been slightly reduced. And aside from that, he was fucking hospitalized just days after that. Yeah, the the timeline of like COVID from from getting it to getting sick with it, it, it checks out. Yeah. Um, and this was the alpha, non-variant. This yeah, the is alpha traditional, strain. classic COVID. Yeah, vanilla COVID. Yeah. Uh... Now, all told, <laughs> it appears as though Trump came in contact with about 500 people after testing positive for the virus. That's a super spreader. Uh, including Joe Biden and those attendants at the debate. Uh, well, and didn't he didn't he test positive before that Rose Garden event that also got like a ton of people sick? Uh, I don't remember the timeline, but yeah, there yeah. was someone in the White House that was like, oops, and we're doing it, the Rose Garden event with no masks. Yeah, there was that big Rose Garden event where like dozens of people it came was a down super with spreader. it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not clear on whether Trump tested positive before or after that. It, it was must, it it must it have the, been. It was the Amy Coney Barrett uh, yeah. thing. That's when yeah, it happened. Anyways, Trump, in a tweet posted to his website because he's banned from Twitter, <laughs> grew angry about the revelation of his positive test and saw it as more unfair coverage from that fake news media. But the guy saying it, it was his former chief of staff. Yes, yeah. but so in his uh, tweet, because that's what he does on his website, in his website tweet, uh, he added that, quote, Biden goes around coughing on people all over the place, and yet the corrupt news doesn't even cover it. Does he, though? Which is, like, as insane as, like, he's got the biggest mask I've ever yeah. seen. Like, Biden goes around coughing on everyone, and yet silence from the media. That's, oh, God. I love when he goes into, like, full-on child mode with stuff like that. Well, I, Biden did it actually, too. Biden's the one who coughs on And people. he did it worse, actually. Um, Why am I getting in trouble for something Joe Biden did? <laughs> I swear to God, he did it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, speaking of Trump's Twitter ban, uh, as you all probably are aware by now, Trump has given the cold shoulder to other right-wing sites like Parler, Gab, Getter, and Frank Speech <laughs> in favor of starting his own social media website called Truth Social. And all those other sites, they're sad about that. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Truth, uh, all caps, TRUTH, a website which has already stumbled out the gate after its initial launch and was taken offline after violating the terms of the open source software license that the software, uh, the, that the platform was built on. Whoops. Yeah. Since then, it's also made the news for having a TOS that effectively bans people from making fun of Trump or the making fun of the platform itself or anything else that would turn that site into something that is not just a GOP echo chamber. Mm -hmm. Uh, still, though, if it can get past regulators, Truth Social will fully launch and be the new social media hub for patriots everywhere. <laughs> and the, the platform just pulled a big name from the GOP's orbit to become CEO of Truth Social's parent company, the Trump Media and Technology Group. And that man is California Congressman Devin Nunes. If anyone has the energy to take on the likes of Twitter, it's a man who filed lawsuits against the company because its users were making fun of him with parody accounts like Devin Nunes Cow oh, yeah. and Devin Nunes Mom. Yes, It's that, personal for Devin. <laughs> this is a vendetta that goes deep. Oh yeah? Well, you'll see what's coming. Yeah. I'm gonna destroy Twitter by manning a completely separate social media app that is absolutely going to succeed. 
Um, that Devin Nunes is now going to be the captain of the Trump social media ship, and he is quitting his job in Congress for the opportunity. Uh, here's Politico with more. Representative Devin Nunes, a close ally of the former President Donald Trump and the former chair of the House Intelligence Committee, will resign from Congress later this month to run Trump's new social media company. Quote, the time has come to reopen the internet and allow for the free flow of ideas and expression without censorship, Nunes said in a statement. The United States of America made the dream of the internet a reality, and it will be an American company that restores that dream. Nunez's pending resignation will set up two elections next year, a special election for the remainder of his term under the old district lines, and the regular election under the new lines for the next Congress beginning in 2023. With the California Democratic Party tweeting, Devin Nunez has long been an embarrassment to California. It's only fitting that he now leaves Congress to debase himself even further to Donald Trump. And um, the Devin Nunez cow account tweeted the following, anybody up for an epic party? And also, is it a good idea to quit your job and work for a company under SEC investigation? Asking for a treasonous cow post. The Devin Nunez cow thing is so funny because like the cow, the, the cow account itself is dumb. It's just some like yes, yeah, lib kofifi bullshit. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it upsets him so much. That's what does it. That's it's like what if, does it. Yeah. It's like if uh, people on the left actually got offended by the Let's Go Brandon thing. Yeah. I mean, um, some, some do. And it's very yeah, sure. pathetic. <laughs> it is. But uh, it's, it's also like, it's time for an American company to step in. Like, okay, yeah. Like, right. Also, like their projections for growth outpace the number of living Trump voters by like 10 or 15% within like a very short time span. So it's like, it's essentially, well, it's not unachievable because there will be looky-loos who create accounts just to like sit on the sidelines and mm -hmm. go sickos. Uh, but it, it, the numbers that they're going for are uh, very high, like in the tens of millions, like 70 million or something like that. And they're fast tracking a uh, public listing for this. Yeah, no, so that's why they're under SEC investigation. <laughs> yeah. Is because they've uh, it's like an acquisition group like partnered with them to get to to make yeah. them go public. They're doing an S pack, which is the hot new thing for getting your company listed on the stock exchange ASAP. But there's uh, behind closed doors conversations that have been happening happening since early 2021. So people in the know were aware that this was happening and could have, uh, I don't know, bought and sold stocks based on information that wasn't publicly available. So that's why they're under the uh, SEC investigation currently. So they have to actually get past that now uh, before launching yeah. the site fully. So there's a lot going on here. Hmm. Yeah. So we expect no shortage of news regarding Truth Social and its CEO in the coming months and years. But Nunes has already broken one of our rules on being a successful CEO. Keeping your name out of the press and operating without the general public knowing who you are at all. Mm -hmm. And our next story today demonstrates that when you go from a name that no average person could recognize to infamy over the course of a very few tumultuous days, uh, it's bad it's for business. Bad for business. <laughs> yeah. So meet Vishal Garg, Mr. Garg, the CEO of mortgage lending website and service Better.com. I keep seeing ads for that. I, so that's different than BetterHelp. It's, it's completely different, I but guess apparently so. run by two separate but equal psychopaths. Pieces of shit, yeah. yeah. Better.com. So this guy, Mr. Garg, <laughs> became the face of evil executives and this year's representation of Mr. Scrooge when he fired 900 employees over a Zoom call just days before the holidays, or weeks, I guess. But yeah. it's the holiday season already, so during the holidays, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's, there's footage of this. Yep. Please enjoy. <laughs> This isn't news that you're gonna to wanna to hear, uh, but ultimately it was my decision and I wanted you to hear from me. We are laying off about 15% of the company. If you're on this call, you are part of the unlucky group being laid off. Your employment here is terminated effective immediately. So this is a company that is reportedly worth nearly $8 billion and had just recently secured nearly a billion dollars worth of investments. Quote, the SoftBank backed mortgage lender announced in May it was going public through an SPAC and last week received $750 million in cash as part of the deal. The company is prepared to have more than $1 billion on its balance sheet. Now, obviously firing 900 people just before or during the holidays, that is, it's terrible. Yeah. But it does happen. I mean, we lived through it. Uh, oh, yeah. Lived through it a couple times. Yeah, Not just at the holidays, but year round. Yeah, they fired a lot of people 
Uh, um, especially around the holidays, yeah. Companies do that. That is a thing they do because they close out their books for the year and everyone forgets. There were people that canceled their holiday trips because of getting fired from yeah. the cinema like and, uh, three weeks before presents. Christmas. Yeah. Had returned presents. Yeah. So this is this is a common thing yeah. with uh, big companies. Real shitty, though. It's the worst possible emotional time to do it, but they don't care. And they act emotional, like you saw in the video, but then he just does it anyway. Uh, and like you can see his tone change, too, in the video where it's like, you know, I hate to have to be the one to do this. And he's like, all right, let's get through this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You're all fired. Um, but yeah, that, obviously firing that many people, it's, it's terrible. And doing it over Zoom, it just really rubs salt in the wound. Um, but in addition to that, this guy decided to go on the offensive when people critiqued both his decision regarding layoffs and the way in which the news was delivered. Uh, he posted to an app called Blind, which allows employees to anonymously communicate, uh, saying, according to Newsweek, you guys know that at least 250 of the people terminated were working an average of two hours a day while clocking eight hours plus a day in the payroll system. They were stealing from you and stealing from our customers who pay the bills that pay our bills. Get educated. Fuck you, Garg. I know. <laughs> uh, they added that Garg later confirmed to Fortune that he was the person who wrote the post despite it being written under the username uneducated. Get educated, you uneducated fucks. Uh, so he, he told Fortune, I think they could have been phrased differently, but honestly, the sentiment is there. This guy sucks. This is in addition to an email that he sent out to staff in previous years that was published by Forbes, where he said, all caps, hello, wake up better team. You are too damn slow. You are a bunch of dumb dolphins <laughs> and dumb dolphins get caught in nets and eaten by sharks. So stop it. Stop it. Stop it right now. You are embarrassing me. So the, you this, dumb dolphins. A, a very odd uh, choice of uh, takedown because dolphins are clearly what, not only just one of the smartest a, uh, animals in the ocean, yeah. one of the smartest animals on the planet. Yeah. Um, and they kill sharks. They, they stab them in the gills with their uh, noses. They do. Um, but yes, also just a weird choice of words. And yeah, this guy seems like a fucking asshole. And it seems like he probably actually enjoyed this despite uh, the first paragraph being like, you know, I hate to have to do this, especially at this time of year. Well, yeah, he doesn't hate it because he gets richer Yes. when he does this. Yes, he probably... He loves He's it. almost certainly has gotten a bonus uh, because yeah. of this. Uh -huh. So this guy, he is currently in, like, phase three of rake stepping. Has he, he, has he called out... Uh, has, he, has he said that he's a victim of cancel culture yet? No, but I'm sure that's, that's coming. That's coming, yeah. Uh, yeah, so like phase three, he I mean, he realizes that he's doing it. <laughs> he realizes that he keeps stepping on rakes, but he's helpless. He can't stop stepping on them. Yeah. The, the ball is all already rolling. He can't stop it. There is no way out. And he's now issued an apology to the remaining employees, which reads in part, team, I want to apologize for the way I handled the layoffs last week. I failed to show the appropriate amount of respect and appreciation for individuals who are affected and for their contributions to better. I own the decision to do the layoffs, but in communicating, I blundered the execution. In doing so, I embarrassed you. I realized that the way I communicated this news made a difficult situation worse. I am deeply sorry and am committed to learning from the situation and doing more to be the leader that you expect me to be. Which is like, again, just the worst statement on it because he's just like, Okay, so I handled it wrong. I'm learning how to fire people better. I'll be more compassionate in the future. I promise. I'm sorry I embarrassed the company by yeah. doing it like a fucking idiot. Also just the most generic apology ever. Yeah, exactly. It's written by someone else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's apparently already too late to do the bare minimum uh, because executives from the company are jumping ship, uh, according to the Daily Beast. Oh, no. The crisis is growing deeper at the startup Better.com, which is stuck in a public relations nightmare after CEO Vishal Garg brutally axed 900 workers in a last-minute webinar. Multiple sources tell the Daily Beast that the company's head of marketing, head of public relations, and vice president of communications all <laughs> submitted their resignations Jeez. in roughly the last week. The heads of communications and PR stepped down in the last two days. Quote, this is a first wave of resignations and the company expects more, a person familiar with the matter said. Rest in piss, better.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. R.I.P. Bozo. <laughs> and and R.I.P. Uh, Garg. Yeah, so while this is, of course, absolutely terrible that anyone here lost their jobs at least their ceo is such a fucking idiot that he's probably doomed himself and the company with his big old bungle oh i really bungled it. i bungled this worse than our 
la- or two presidents ago, President O'Bungler. <laughs> <laughs> bungled this worse than Obama bungled the rollout of, of the Affordable Care Act. Am I right, folks? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it sounds like working for him sucked anyway, so I don't know. Hopefully all those affected are able to land on their feet and will fall into better jobs with CEOs that aren't complete fucking morons who can't manage a company worth billions of dollars without firing people during the holiday season. Mm-hmm. Remember all that money we just got? Well, you're all fired. It's definitely the kind of thing where after the initial uh, shock and uh, whatnot of getting fired goes away, probably going to be glad they're uh, not working for this guy anymore. These guys can do eight hours of work in two hours? Hire them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it always sucks, and it sucks seeing this so publicly, but you uh, really get a taste of what, what it's like to go through this because, it's, uh, yeah, in the video, he's like, if you're still on this video call, you're terminated. Uh, and you, there's, there's like a, t- a TikTok of someone watching it, and they're just like, are you fucking kidding me? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's bad. Um, but uh, we do have more news for you today, but be warned, it is news about the devil's lettuce Uh-oh. and YouTube. And those godforsaken NFTs everybody's been on about. No. But first, I'll put the NFTs last so everyone okay. can tune out before that. <laughs> um, but first, let's take a second to thank today's sponsors, starting with Omaha Steaks. Yum. And we've, of course, been getting shipments of Omaha Steaks for years now. It is such a great feeling because not only do you get a bunch of delicious meats to cook, their sides and desserts are incredible. The holidays are obviously right around the corner, and finding the perfect gift is tricky. It's getting late, folks. Time to commit. Yeah. Omaha Steaks makes it easy to send friends and family an unforgettable gift guaranteed to be loved. Just go to omahasteaks.com and enter today daily into the search bar to order the perfect gift package. For $99.99, you'll get 24 entrees like the world-famous bacon-wrapped filet mignons, chicken breasts, sides, desserts, and so much more. When you use code Today Daily, you'll also get an additional eight Omaha Steaks burgers free with your order. We've all heard the news about those shortages and shipping delays. So don't wait on this. Order the perfect gift package today at omahasteaks.com and you'll get eight free burgers when you enter the code today daily. Mm -hmm. Achieve gifting greatness with Omaha Steaks. Incredible flavor, incredible value, and 100% guaranteed. omahasteaks.com, keyword today daily. This episode is also sponsored by stamps.com. If you're looking for ways to skip the trip down to the post office and dodge all that hectic holiday shopping traffic, why not save time and money with stamps.com? Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year long. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. Whether you're selling online or running an office or side hustle, Stamps.com can save you so much time, money, and stress during the holidays. Access all the post office and UPS shipping services that you need without taking the trip and get discounts that you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and up to 76 off, uh, 76% off UPS. Going to the post office instead of using Stamps.com is kind of like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. Just going up a couple floors? Sure, take the stairs. Walking up 30 flights a day? Are you insane? <laughs> take a break. If you spend more than a few minutes a week dealing with mail and shipping, Stamps.com is a lifesaver. You'll save so much time and money, you'll wonder why you didn't start sooner. Save time and money this holiday season with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code ITDAILY for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code ITDAILY. All right, back into the news now with YouTube somehow admitting that they messed up and they hurt potentially thousands of smaller channels, and they're just not going to do a damn thing to fix the problem. Tough. Uh, We've brought it up countless times on this show, but the YouTube copyright claim system is completely broken. And not only will your videos get erroneously claimed despite legally falling under fair use, but there's also bad actors out there who go around claiming videos and siphoning off the ad revenue despite not actually owning the content that they're trying to claim in the first place. It is a total and complete mess. And... Now YouTube's admitting that uh, it's got a problem. That's the first step. Yeah. But it is one that they apparently can't solve. Uh, In a recent transparency report analyzed by The Verge, YouTube revealed millions of incorrect copyright claims in just six months. Uh, Here's their reporting. Over 2.2 million copyright claims hit YouTube videos before later being overturned between January and June of this year, according to a new report published by the company today. The Copyright Transparency Report is the first of its kind published by YouTube, which says it will update biannually going forward. 
And they do add that this only accounts for 1% of the total claims, showing just how massive the site is and honestly how much content is constantly being uploaded. Uh, but uh, the reporting continues. When users disputed these claims, the case was resolved in favor of the uploader of the video 60% of the time, according to the report. Though mistaken copyright claims are a drop in the bucket on a larger scale, YouTube creators have long complained about how the platform handles claims, saying overly aggressive or unjustified enforcement can lead to lost income. Copyright claims can result in videos being blocked, audio being muted, or ad revenue going back to the rights owner. This new report gives shape to a problem that YouTube itself has acknowledged needs updating. As we said, YouTube didn't announce anything new in regards to fixing the amount of false claims that they receive, which are then overturned all of which happen after the creator has undoubtedly lost revenue from the videos, nor have they said anything about consequences for users or companies who falsely claim videos despite not having the rights to do so. Uh, the article concludes saying, the new report notes that no system is perfect and that errors happen even with established guardrails in place to prevent abuse of enforcement mechanisms. Quote, when disputes take place, the process provided by YouTube provides real recourse, and over 60% of these disputes were resolved in favor of the uploader, the report that's, says. That's one way of spinning it, I guess. You know, we reversed it. We fixed the glitch. And then another thing that we should add, though, is that uh, it's legitimately scary trying to dispute a false copyright yeah. claim because there are potential legal ramifications if YouTube does favor the claimant. Uh, and one of the more extreme results would be having to defend yourself legally, which costs way more than almost any video would ever be worth. Yeah. And uh, they're the people doing this bullshit are banking on you. Not fighting it. Yeah, being too scared or too uh, just, you know, don't have the resources to do anything about it. Yes. They yes. Know, they and know then, like, that a certain amount of people are just going to let it go. And there's so. like sometimes, like it doesn't happen often anymore because we're good about it, but like, Sometimes where it's like, oh, so-and-so has claimed this audio. I don't even remember the last time we got it. But it's like, okay, have the ad revenue now. Yeah, it's like sure. nothing. Um, but then there's times where it's like, clearly we're using footage that is fair use. And instead of them taking the ad revenue, they just take the video down. It's just gone. Yeah, it's... There's at least three videos from this channel that are no longer available uh, from the past because of that. And there's like ones where we're like uploaded and be like, it's already taken down. Yeah. See, I think you recently had to go in and cut a part out and re-upload it. Yeah, I can't remember what the footage was, but it was like, I think it was like the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. But like five seconds yeah. of referential footage, and it's like <laughs> the whole video is coming down. Yeah, it was just like a tiny little snippet of some news report. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, let's chill out now. Talk about some pot news. <laughs> Some weed news. Sup, Stoner. Some Laffy Taffy, la Wacky Tobacco. Wacky Tobacco. Anyway, marijuana is legal here in California, which means it's no longer cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in many other states across this nation, it's also legal. But there's still a black market for weed, and sometimes it's hard for dispensaries to compete because they have to abide by all the rules. The criminals do not. <laughs> well, San Francisco just threw its dispensaries a life preserver by delaying a tax so that legal stores don't have to compete with street dealers. Here's NPR. City officials in San Francisco want to delay the imposition of a tax on lawful recreational cannabis businesses to help them compete with illegal marijuana dealers. Cannabis businesses create good jobs for San Franciscans and provide safe, regulated products to their customers, Supervisor Raphael Mandelman said in a tweet. Now is not the time to impose a new tax on small businesses that are just getting established and trying to compete with illicit operators. Last week, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed an ordinance to suspend the cannabis business tax for the 2021 and 2022 tax years. The ordinance requires a signature from San Francisco Mayor London Breed before it takes effect. Quote, Mayor Breed does intend to sign the ordinance once it passes the Board of Supervisors on a second reading tomorrow, the mayor's office told NPR. So, that's good. Yeah, good job, San Francisco. Now just uh, fix everything wrong with your dystopian hellscape of a city, please. Mm -hmm. Step one, complete. Step yeah. two through 10,000, we're working on it. Yeah, it'd be really cool if now you could make it uh, affordable for anyone who isn't a fucking millionaire to live there. That would be that would be awesome. Yeah, I can't... Like, I can picture New York people getting by in some, like, of the boroughs and stuff like that. It's very expensive. Yeah. Los Angeles, obviously, I know because I live here. But San Francisco, I can't think of, like, anyone who can live in the city of San Francisco. Yeah, you can only... You can only live in San Francisco on like a working or middle class wage if you've lived there for 10 years 
because they do have rent control. Yeah, had the apartment passed down. Yeah, you you can just never you never can move. Yeah, because if you move, then you're paying market rates now. And, it's nuts. And the landlords of San Francisco, they are, of course, the landlords everywhere hate rent control. But the landlords in San Francisco, they're like, oh my god. If I could just get rid of this fucking tenant, this old lady like, who's been here for 20 years, I could be making 10 times more on it. Yeah. There's, I mean, the LA to you, there's, there's places you can go to, I mean, it's not aff affordable or by any means, but like LA has places that are. Yeah. Better places to go. Santa Monica also has great rent control. There's yeah. uh, uh there was a, I think LA times a while back, uh, some old lady was paying like, like $400 a month to live like Insane. beachfront fucking apartment. Yeah. Yeah, San Francisco, yeah. you can't be like, Oakland's extremely expensive now, too. That used to be, people used to commute yeah, from the, Oakland. Yeah, the spillover zone. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And you certainly can't go south, because that's even more money. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. The Bay Area, so, uh, they got a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Anyways, of let's problems. Uh, let's move <laughs> over, because it's time for NFT news. Uh, so if you're going to leave the video now, just remember to like it. And uh, we're sorry, we promise to do better next time. Well, we, we do have to report on these things. Yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you want us to fucking do? It's, it's fucking, it, the NFTs are bonkers. It doesn't stop. Uh, over the past week or so, the art world has once again descended onto Miami for Art Basel. Uh, it's the festival that brought us great works of art like the banana duct tape to a wall. Now, of course, NFTs were going to be all the rage this year. And, yep. and yeah, there were plenty of digital exhibits, lots of schmoozing and lots of crypto bros flexing all their weird animal portraits. But there were also some new, very creative debuts in the world of NFTs, including one where an artist auctioned off one of her eggs as an NFT. What the fuck? Here's the Daily Beast. Uh, an Armenian artist was hawking one of her eggs as a non-fungible token at Art Basel Miami Beach over the weekend. Narina Arakelian, 42, brought a triptych titled Love, Hope, Live to the Contemporary Art Fair. The live portion of the painting has been digitized as an NFT, a digital token registered on the blockchain, according to page six. It was set to be auctioned with an embedded contract promising an egg from Arakelian's ovaries to the buyer. The artist said she hoped it would be purchased by a couple who have had trouble conceiving in the past, saying she was, quote, happy to bring a child into the world through my artwork. She clarified that Quote, the child will be a child once they are born, not a piece of art. No, <laughs> that's going to be a living, breathing NFT. That, that kid's on the blockchain. Yes. I mean, technically, yes. Yeah. But I don't, I, I can't see a couple in need of an egg buying this because the, I, I just can't see them as the type of people that would be like, hey, cool, cool art project. Let's spend... Yeah what I assume is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on it, so that our future child is on the blockchain. Yeah. This is going to be someone who buys it just to ha own someone's ovary egg. It's very weird. I don't like it. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Not to be outdone by a woman and her ovaries. The gamers have new NFTs to look out for as well, because Ubisoft has finally made good on their promise. They're their threat to, <laughs> to bring non-fungible tokens to AAA video games with collectibles being distributed through Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Breakpoint as soon as this week. Here's Polygon with the story. NFTs are coming to Ubisoft's Ghost Recon Breakpoint as unique collectible in-world cosmetics, the publisher announced Tuesday. Ubisoft described the implementation of NFTs in its game as an experiment heading off a concern about the environmental impact of the technology by calling its new venture as energy efficient and environmentally sustainable. Digits, as Ubisoft calls them, will be the first NFTs or non-fungible tokens playable in a AAA game, the publisher said. Digits will be introduced to Breakpoint's Windows PC versions via the Ubisoft Connect platform. Ubisoft is also setting up another platform called Ubisoft Quartz to manage the acquisition of these NFTs. Okay. I mean, really, this is the this is DLC that they claim is backed on the blockchain. But all it is is DLC. That you, it's 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 the same thing that Steam yeah. has had with uh, the weapon skins in uh, Counter Strike. Yeah. They already did this, and it's already tied to a ledger. Yeah, there's no need to <laughs> blockchain any of this. But they're doing it because of the hype surrounding it. Yeah, it's 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 insane. But anyways, quote. 
Each digit is a unique collectible that features its own serial number for others to see in game. Can you can you sand off the serial number? Yeah, you have to scratch all. It's like a <laughs> VIN on a stolen car. Yeah. Uh, Ubisoft said in a statement announcing Quartz, also keeping track of its current and previous owners for years to come, making players an integral part of the game's history. Like, what's the fucking life cycle on this game? Uh, I wasn't aware that people were still playing it. Yeah. I mean, like, again, uh, Counter-Strike already has skins trading with no need for the blockchain, but a game like Counter-Strike, would, this would actually make some sense because it's like... A it's game, a legacy game. It's a game that people have been playing for fucking 25 years, but yeah. like... Ghost Recon Breakpoint? Like, is anyone going to be playing this shit in five years? I mean, it, like, maybe maybe if they make it transferable to, like, hey, by the way, we're doing Tom Clancy's Division 5 now, and you can transfer your NFTs, and you'll see the... It's cool, because you can look at the gun, and you can see the serial number, and you'll know that that's your serial number. And it's like, I guarantee, like, somewhere within Steam's data that you can see the skin of a gun... And who has owned it all the way down the line? I wonder if they're under any obligation to keep hosting that stuff. Because, like, game servers go down all the time for old multiplayer games. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it t- t- usually takes, like, five to ten this years. This is all experimenting. It, it happens. Anyway, um, this is going to fail, and I, I can't wait to see it fail. Yeah, the statement said digits are playable cosmetic items that, quote, provide players the ability to personalize their experience and complete their missions with style. That already exists! I know! It's skins! <laughs> It already exists, but it's going to be like, oh, this one has a swatch of paint that goes this way, and this one has a swatch of paint that goes this way, and this one has a tear on the sleeve here, but this one has a tear on the sleeve here. Even if that, like that, you could already do that. There's nothing stopping you. You know what would be the ultimate way? You're the game company. It's your game. You know the, the ultimate way to make your character unique in a game like this is make it fully customizable through a menu system Wouldn't where you're that able be to cool? alter... Everything about it, which is something that existed in video games 15 years ago. Hell, you used to be able to import your face to Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Like, has it ever been a problem in any game that, like, your your fucking collectibles are missing or not there? Like, has it ever been an issue? No, this, these are, are unique to you with unique serial numbers on, like, whatever. Uh, and they're valuable. They uh-huh. have perceived value because of scarcity. Yeah. It's, it's all on the blockchain. With digits, items are no longer bound to a player's game inventory since they can be put on sale for other eligible players to acquire outside of the Ubisoft ecosystem, the company said. The climate controversy swirling around NFT, uh, Tuesday's uh, announcement said Ubisoft's digits will be stored on the Tezos blockchain, or Tezos blockchain, which is a proof-of-stake blockchain as opposed to the more energy-intensive proof-of-work blockchains of Ethereum or Bitcoin. Quote, a single transaction on Tezos uses roughly the same amount of energy as streaming 30 seconds of video, Ubisoft asserted. Okay. Uh, Still, this is so unnecessary. You don't understand. They're creating a marketplace by which they retain all of the scarcity and value and in which they themselves get a cut of every transaction, no matter how minuscule or large. So I just don't feel like gamers are going to be... I feel like gamers are going to reject this. Um, I would lean more towards that, although, as we've seen w- with many things over the past five years, uh, the smaller the group and the louder they are, the more that the general population and media seems to pay attention to them. Yeah. Uh, wrongfully so, in almost every case. Yeah. Um, so this will be like, wow, it's... it's uh, look, everyone's really adopting this, and, and everyone's talking about how great it is. And have you seen how much money these jackets in Ghost Recon are selling for? Tom Cl- Clancy could have never predicted such a travesty. Like even setting up a fucking wallet to like put this shit in. Well, you this got, is going to be above. You're most signing up for heads. a new Ubisoft product called Ubisoft Quartz. Uh, yeah. But then you can, pro- uh, according to that, you can transfer it to like something like OpenSea, and then. Yeah. I'm very interested to see how this works and how quickly it'll fail because that's the other thing too is they're doing with a game that is absolutely not popular compared yeah. to other titles. They're testing the waters for sure because otherwise they would do it with like, I don't know, what other multiplayer games does Ubisoft even have? Division, uh, Assassin's Creed is not multi- multiplayer, but yeah. Uh, yeah, shit like that. Whatever. Is uh, Far Cry. That's a single, is Far Cry multiplayer? Yeah, they have co-op and stuff. Yeah, well... Anyway. You're going to own the gasoline barrel 
that's in the level that you can blow up. When it blows up and shrapnel shreds the enemies to bits, there you're going to see your serial number on the ground. Yeah. It's going to be incredible. Pretty cool. And huh? all the other players are going to see it too. Pretty cool. Ugh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, this shit is just, it's wearing me down. I, I, one of my favorite art galleries, a place I bought a lot of actual good, real life art from. Saw on Twitter, they changed their fucking picture to a fucking board ape. Now you're gonna buy a board ape screen print? I'm like, and, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, I think, I'm just thinking of all the artists that sell their art through this gallery. The artists that you see at like Artist Alley at fucking Comic Cons and shit. Like how they must feel. Extremely talented people, how they must feel that one of the galleries they work for has a fucking board ape. How, <laughs> their how, profile picture. how well do you think it would go over if a uh, NFT artist set up a like digital frame and uh, and like little infinite objects frames at Artist Alley at one of the Comic Cons? I don't think it would go over very well. <laughs> I would like to imagine that they would get beat up in a video game or chased out in shame. Yeah. Um, um, not to say that they aren't artists, but it's just weird. I don't know. There are a lot of well, that's the thing is like. There's a lot of good artists that are doing this like, because board apes are like literally like procedurally generated. Yeah. <laughs> like there's no fucking talent. That there's goes a lot of it. great artists who are getting in on this because that's what the market dictates. Yeah, but sure, you know, whatever. Anyways, that's it for today's episode. Uh, if you haven't already watched uh, this week's episode of uh, Weekly Weird News, please check that out as well as a new episode of News Dump. Check both of those out. Watch them. Like them. Like this. Leave a comment, and we'll see you soon for some tech news. Bye bye. Bye.